Welcome back to the research stage and our final session of the day, which will focus on fighting misinformation. While researching the topic of misinformation, I came across a headline which grabbed my attention. Quote, a vaccination against the pandemic of misinformation, end quote. This is a total coincidence because the headline is from an article in the magazine Scientific American. And this session features two editors from Scientific American. Laura and Jen are here to discuss how scientists, researchers, and journalists are fighting back against misinformation and developing strategies to what they call outcompete it. So a big thank you to Springer Nature, our COGX 2021 partner, which curated this session. I'll now hand things over to Laura Helmuth, who is Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American. Welcome, Laura. Thank you so much. That's great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, and thanks for being agents of information in a world of misinformation. It's, uh, I think everybody who comes to this conference has an interest in kind of being the signal in the signal to noise ratio in the world. And there's so much noise right now. And so we're trying to do what we can to amplify the signal and amp amplify reality. Uh, and so, you know, some of you may know that misinformation has been um, a really hot topic of scientific research in the past several years uh, in the US. A lot of it was inspired by the Trump administration, to, to be quite frank. Um, and then, of course, there's been a lot of journalism coverage. And as science journalists, we cover misinformation as, um, as a subject of research, as um, something that just people in the world need to know about so that they can understand it and help defend themselves against it. Uh, and also so that we as, as writers, as communicators can, can do a better job to, to outcompete it, to make reality as interesting and as sticky and as memorable as misinformation and conspiracy theories and all the other nonsense that's circulating. And of course, as you all know, the stakes could not be higher. Uh, misinformation we've seen during the pandemic is literally deadly. People are dying who didn't need to die because of misinformation about the pandemic at every stage. Uh, from the beginning when people in, in positions of power said it was a hoax um, to what we're dealing with now, which is a lot of uh, conspiracy theories about vaccines and, and this sort of misinformation is, is literally deadly. So uh, it's just really important that we get it right and that we help people understand what's information, what's misinformation, and how to tell the difference, how to defend themselves against disinformation, misinformation, and just bad ideas. Um, so today, um, so I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Scientific American, and my colleague Jen Schwartz and I are going to talk about uh, what we've been learning in the past two years. We've been covering misinformation quite a bit. Um, Jen is a features editor with us, and she's she has a lot of experience um, writing and editing and sort of experiencing uh, mock misinformation uh, crises. Um, so I think she, she'll, be, she'll be on camera here too. And uh, we want to start out by, um, I think all, uh, I think Jen, did you want to, we, ha we have kind of a run of show of discussion questions. This, you'll see, this is very informal. We're just going to talk about what we know. And we want to hear what you want to hear about too. So um, for those of you who haven't been asking questions before, there's a nice uh, chat question box. So put your questions in at any point, and we're going to leave plenty of time at the end to talk about you know, your ideas and your questions about misinformation as well. But Jen, welcome. Thanks for coming today. Yeah, it's great to chat with you about this because both of us have been involved in this topic for a long time and it just feels like it becomes more and more relevant and it also is one of these things that becomes more and more exhausting uh, to comprehend and to deal with and I think it's important to remember that that's sort of the point of a lot of misinformation is that um, it, it is meant to overwhelm to confuse and so uh, we've been really working on at Scientific American making sense of how complicated that is and how as individuals we can better wrap our minds around the problem uh, that this is not just you know a research issue or a media issue but a uh, an issue for everyone who operates um, you know online and in real life because it's not just a digital problem uh, and so at, you know at the magazine we have done special reports uh, you know, taking up the entire magazine uh, in 2019, we had a entire issue called Truth, Lies and Uncertainty. Um, and it looked at misinformation, not just uh, what you're seeing on your social platforms, but what is even the physics of reality? What is the nature of reality? 
Um, you know, so we looked at physics and math, and then we looked at how the brain, uh, how people perceive reality differently, how deception shows up in the, you know, across uh, animal species, um, how corruption forms. And so, you know, we really try to understand it from that broad based perspective. And I, I think that's what's made it really interesting, um, you know, for us as journalists is that this isn't just a, an, an algorithmic problem. It isn't just a technology platform problem that, you know, we are trying to process it from a much broader perspective. Yes. And um, so, Jen, you know, one of there's there's a lot of different ways to sort of report on misinformation and, uh, you know, which is how we do any of our science reporting. We call up experts. We ask them questions. We read the scientific literature. Uh, we do our own reporting. We do some of our own data analysis. Um, but, Jen, you had one of the most uh, kind of terrifying and entertaining reporting experiences uh, when you were preparing uh, for the for the most recent U.S. presidential elections. There was a, a, a um, kind of a, a, a what would you call it uh, like a mock um, a mock election night. Uh, how could you tell us about that? I, I love war game. <laughs> war game. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it's not, it, it wouldn't have been called a war game, but that's sort of the inspiration and my, what, you know, people might be more fam familiar with these tabletop war games that have been used historically um, to sort of game out and strategize, um, you know, what, what might happen. Uh, and what's really interesting is, um, you know, agency, health, health agencies and, and, and governments often we'll use these live simulation events uh, to, to try to prepare for what might happen. And, you know, health organizations, um, you know, often run scenarios for what if there was a, an emergent disease? Um, how do we prevent this from becoming a pandemic? And so what's interesting is, is this type of preparation um, was used by a lot of health agencies prior to the pandemic. Um, but these these simulations are only as good as the circumstances that you put into them. And so, you know, you might have to confront what if this thing happens? What if that thing happens? But uh, if you're running a simulation and you don't take into account, well, what if uh, the president of the country or uh, decides that the virus is not real? Um, if, if that's not, you know, a predicted uh, a scenario, then no one would know how to respond. You're not practicing responding to something like that. So I, I think in the past several years, there's been this acknowledgement that as journalists or as anyone processing information and trying to communicate it to others, uh, we need to better be almost be more imaginative of what uh, what what complicates and we might be up against and, and what sort of misinformation might really hamper our ability to communicate effectively. And so um, I had gone to this live event with this research group called First Draft, which is based in the US, but is also all over the world. And they help uh, journalists and media organizations deal with uh, misinformation and disinformation. And they have really focused in the past year or so on the pandemic. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I met up with them. It was, I, I think it was January or February of 2019 before we were all separate. And it's basically a lot of journalists getting together in a room, splitting up into groups and putting and becoming mock newsrooms. And I, uh, you know, we get to have the election day, a uh, voting day, be the simulation. And then there's a sort of uh, a mock Twitter, mock Facebook and information is coming in, people on social media might say certain things, and as a, a newspaper, we had to respond. But I decided, instead of trying to be, you know, an earnest reporter, uh, an earnest editor-in-chief who's trying to get out good information, what would it look like if we became actual agents of disinformation? What if we were a newsroom that was intending to confuse and to overwhelm because maybe we wanted to get more clicks or maybe our publisher was someone who had an agenda or whatever it might be. Um, maybe we were created uh, you know, by some faction in another country to push propaganda. Um, and so having, having researched these things as a journalist over time, I wanted to know what it would feel like to play the bad guy. 
and how that might disrupt the rest of the simulation, how all these other newsrooms would have to respond to my newsroom, muddying the information space. And it was so effective, um, not just in the way that it disrupted all the other newsrooms, they had to pay attention to me now, this chaos agent, um, instead of reporting out what was really going on in election day. So I, was a, I became a huge distraction but it was also really profound for me as just an individual to feel my heart race and, and to feel that power and how I was controlling an environment to use all of these techniques that we've learned and um, that really work in disinformation. What language do you use? What framing? And to watch it just spread across the simulation. And you really start to understand then this isn't just about you know companies putting out propaganda or governments, that everyday people who might feel like they don't have power um, or, or might feel disenfranchised or, or angry or whatever it might be, um, this really, you know, being disruptive, it gives you a huge sense of, of power and control. And you can see why it can be so powerful for people to, to operate in this way. Um, and, and that was hugely informative for me because I, I understood the embodied experience of why disinformation um, has become such a, a, a powerful way of, of communicating. Nice. Yeah, I love it. So if, uh, if, if anybody here wants to, wants to read all about it, um, uh, Jen wrote up her experiences for, for another special issue we did about misinformation uh, that I think ran right before the 2020 election in the 2020 US presidential election. And uh, one of the things that really comes through is is just the joy, like it's a thrill to have, to have this power. And you know, you, you were like a, just an evil genius. Um, so it was, it was really fun to read about that experience. And, and especially, I mean, you know, you people just met Jen, she's lovely. She's a very kind person. She wouldn't intentionally like distort all of reality uh, if it wasn't a simulation, but she certainly had a good time in the simulation. And it was, it was fun to read about. Um, and I think you know it's one, yeah. What one of the uh, one of the findings of research when when, when you know, there's been a ton of research to find out. Okay, where does misinformation come from? Who's starting it? How does it spread? Where are the where are the points at which you could potentially intervene to to slow down the spread of something to to debunk effectively? And um, you know some of the findings are, are a little you know, d not surprising but still distressing. Um, there have been a bunch of studies of Twitter and how how misinformation spreads on Twitter and the, it, you know over and over again the studies show that misinformation travels farther and faster uh, than real information and um, there have been some you know some research on who's spreading it. Uh, the misinformation that historically in the U.S. has spread the, the farthest and fastest tends to be um, right wing. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the Trump kind of very conservative media ecosystem is where a lot of it originated and where a lot of it um, got amplified. And um, but interestingly, you know, we we talk a lot about platforms and what they can and should do, and uh, deplatforming is a is a really effective way to stop somebody who's a who's a frequent source of misinformation. Um, but in the US, it, it was pretty clear that a, a, you know, the vast majority of, of misinformation, especially about the pandemic, uh, came through the White House, either originated in the White House or it was some you know, stray, not very uh, well known piece of misinformation that then got amplified and spread by the White House during the Trump administration. So um, we, I've, I've yet to see any good research to see you know, if, if it's starting to slow down. I know with, uh, with uh, after there was a wave of deplatforming, um, and I think that did make a difference. Uh, but, but it's you know, this is ongoing research happening in real time. Uh, but you know, aside from the most at the time most powerful person in the world, um, a lot of the people who who do originate misinformation are just doing it for the lulls, just for fun. Uh, and that's really hard to stop. I mean, if people have a lot of time on their hand and uh, and find this entertaining, uh, it's it's really hard to stop it. Um, one of the you know, so deplatforming though is is very effective, and I think one of the um, examples we saw sort of early on in the um, appreciation of just how how fast misinformation can take hold. Some of you may remember a few years ago there was just this wave of more and more people, especially young people, coming across uh, videos on YouTube claiming that the Earth is flat, and um, 
they would they, because of the way the algorithm was working and because of the monetization of some of these videos once somebody encountered one of these videos they would be um, fed kind of a, a, a just a long string of others along the same lines in just an algorithmic way and you know by the time they'd spent a few hours digging around and watching these videos that look like documentaries and have very elaborate explanations of how this conspiracy has worked and uh, one of the ideas I like is that, that Antarctica is actually the edge of the earth and, and there's a kind of an ice wall like in Game of Thrones and that's what keeps the water from of the oceans from rolling out. So it was very elaborate. It wasn't just somebody saying, oh, the earth is flat. They had lots of, you know, flashy um, videos and, and and graphics to explain why why it's flat and, and why this this important fact has been hidden from all of us and it just gets more, um, more nefarious all the time. Um, but I think that's what's fun about it. I mean, I think it's, it's like it's people, um, you know, especially if you're sitting at home during lockdowns in a pandemic, um, you know, it, it's 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 world building. I think that's what we've seen with a lot of conspiratorial thinking um, is that, you know, and even, you know, when we talk about misinformation and disinformation, it's worth just quickly, you know, defining the terms misinformation um, is anything that is spread that is, you know, it's it's wrong and it's an, it's inaccurate, but it, it might be being spread unwittingly. You know, plenty of people might share a post and the information isn't correct, but they might think it's correct or maybe they trust, you know, uh, whoever had originally posted it. And, and disinformation is uh, intentionally wrong information meant to deceive. Um, it has an intention to do harm. And, and so misinformation is a little bit more of this umbrella term where we can all get wrapped up in it without necessarily having like evil intentions to deceive others. But yeah, I mean, it, there's a lot of like uh, game, you know, game theory involved in how much fun it is to participate in building a story and, and linking up with others and sort of ha uh, solving a puzzle, if you will. That That's very, you know, engaging uh, feeling for a lot of people. And and I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, Laura, you, you have a PhD in neuroscience and we, we talk a lot about you know, how AI might help, you know, solve the problem of misinformation when, as a lot of us know, um, you know, the algorithmic fun functions of a lot of these social platforms, they're, they're designed really to, to have misinformation spread because it's often very uh, exciting or it makes you very angry, it's emotionally charged. And so AI isn't necessarily, you know, uh, the single or even one of the best solutions for dealing with this problem. We know uh, increasingly that it might be affecting our brains and how we process things. And uh, with, with your background, I mean, what have, what do you think and what have you heard about what this, what this is doing to us and our ability to just make sense of reality versus not reality? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not good. It's <laughs> things are, things seem to be getting worse. I mean, of course, during the pandemic, you know, it was a terrifying and scary and uncertain time. And so um, there was, you know, it was just perfect conditions for disinformation and conspiracy theories to really um, spark and for people to get excited about them and, and come up with their own theories to kind of fill these gaps in knowledge, gaps in understanding of, okay, what's happening with this pandemic? Why is this virus spreading when people, uh, even if people don't have symptoms, you know, is it washing your hands that will do it? You know, how, how is this happening? What are, is it, um, you know, what, and, and, you know, when do you need masks, all this stuff. There, I mean, there was some legitimate concern. And in, this is one of the issues we face a lot as as um, as science journalists is that, you know, the, the audience is, is understandably hates to find out something and then find out later that what they learned was wrong. And so um, kind of one of the messages that we keep uh, amplifying, which I think helps people understand science and, and also I think can help defend them against misinformation is the idea that science is iterative, ideally it's self-correcting uh, when there's a, you know, a new virus, for instance, that behaves differently than any other virus we've encountered before, um, there will be new things that are learned along the way. And when, when we publish a story about the pandemic, we're giving you basically what's, what's the best information right now uh, with the expectation that it could change. And a lot of times uh, we'll, we'll have the headlines that say, you know, for instance, is the, is the coronavirus airborne? Here's what we know so far. And that would have been from, you know, March or so of, of last year when we were just starting to realize it can spread without people sneezing and coughing and having a fever. 
Um, so, it, but, but there's a lot of frustration. People understandably are be, would, you know, want to know everything. And, and it's, it's very unsatisfying to be told, well, we don't know yet. We don't know yet um, where it originated. We don't know yet what the animal reservoir is for this, for this disease. Um, so conspiracy, theory, conspiracy theories especially really, really play on that like desire to understand and that frustration with ambiguity that a lot of people have. Uh, so that's that's something to to sort of help people understand that this is why these things are so sticky. This is why they're so alluring. Is that it promises you like this great understanding of how the world works. Um, that's in a way, even though it's maybe elaborate conspiracies, they're much more simple than than how the world really actually does work, which is confusing and and, uh, and ambiguous in a lot of situations. Um, as far as dealing with uh, misinformation, one of the big challenges we have is how and when and to debunk something. So if there is a piece of misinformation that's floating around the world, um, how do you stop it? And how do you uh, defend people against getting infected with this misinformation? And if they are, how do you kind of cure them of that misinformation? And there's been a lot of really good research showing that there are kind of best practices for doing that. And in a way, um, it's hard to do at scale, but the, the most effective ways to uh, to get somebody to, to reject a piece of misinformation and accept a real piece of information is kind of one on one is, is getting trust, getting information from somebody they trust who they're close to. Um, so that kind of means that everybody here is, is deputized, like it's, it's up to all of us to talk to our cousins, talk to our neighbors. And when they um, share, you know, dangerous misinformation to uh, to to identify it as misinformation. Uh, if you know how, you know, explain where it came from, uh, explain what the actual information is, provide um, provide you know background, provide evidence, uh, and and it's it's sort of a painstaking process that's it's often done just you know one on one uh, to to try and fix things. Um, other than deplatforming, I haven't seen that many great examples of how to use kind of non-human technology to, to stop misinformation. Uh, the platforms are certainly trying, um, but Jen, what do you think? Do you, have, you seen, or do you, have you seen ideas that seem promising for how to kind of scale up the fight against misinformation? I mean, I think you, you nailed it, that the platforms, you know, they can do a lot to try to police the problem after the fact. But we know that that catches very little of the actual problem and that, you know, anyone who's spreading disinformation is just going to find a way around whatever the late, you know, just, they're just going to find a workaround. And we've seen that they've gone to other platforms or they close out a group and start a new group or, you know, or people go into secret groups that can't be, uh, you know, monitored um, anywhere as effectively. And so you're right that there's what we have, what we haven't really focused on enough, you know, is, is is trust um, and how there's part of why we're in this uh, predicament is that institutional detrust, uh, distrust worldwide has been in decline for a long time. And so, you know, you have to look at who do, who do people trust? And it's often maybe, you know, someone they follow online or a, a local, you know, community leader, someone at, at a church um, or, you know, friends and family. Uh, and it, it might not be, you know, your doctor. It might not be the the CDC. Um, if if you don't, you know, have a good relationship with that person and or or that group, or you don't really know much about them, and so I think there's been a push to say we we need uh, really solid public health information to be, you know, distributed and pushed out um, in a much more local, networked, community based way. Um, and it's it's really um, you know, tricky because it's not just about saying, hey, this thing is wrong. It's about having to ask first, what are you concerned about? What are your fears? What have you heard? And to to really come with, you know, an openness toward hearing someone who might feel quite entrenched, um, you know, in, in their beliefs and, uh, and might not respond to just being told that they're wrong. And so there's been a lot of research into techniques about what is the process for, you know, having an open conversation where you might get someone you know to 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 
you know, maybe reconsider what they've heard. And it, it works best when you ask the person what their fears and concerns are and say, I understand, you know, it's a scary time for me too. Here's what I've learned. And having that personal connection, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in groups, um, it's not us versus them, fact versus fiction, sort of wading into that, hey, this is confusing for all of us. It's an uncertain time, but you know, here, here's what, um, Here's the best information. It's iterative. Uh, we're all working through this together. And there's been a lot of research in how we can just better communicate in that way. And that really has nothing to do with, um, you know, putting up a flag on, on a uh, social media post, which while effective in some ways doesn't get at, you know, that, that broken trust that a lot of us feel and, and the skepticism we have to people who uh, in this, these polarized times, if they're they're not in our in-group, we might just decide that everything they say is is wrong. Uh, so that's where a lot of this communication breaks down. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. And that you know, you mentioned some of the the mistrust of institutions, and and that's gotten so much worse. And 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 you know, as as journalists, that that's something that we've you know, it, that's really been a problem. Uh, during the Trump administration, he repeatedly called news he didn't like fake news, and claimed that all of the you know quite well reported and and evidence based and fully vetted articles, if 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 they didn't please him, he would say it's just made up. They you know there's no such thing, and um, so kind of sowing distrust of of legitimate journalism was super dangerous, especially then during the pandemic when. Uh, journalists were providing some of the most reliable information about how to protect yourself from the pandemic. Um, so we see, you know, that the, the distrust is really amplifying the problem and and, uh, and and making it harder to fight because there are fewer um, fewer places that are trusted. Uh, there's there's one I don't you know we could be unremittingly grim about this, but um, there is a, a nice example. Uh, there's a, a a network of of um, of climate for, for climate communication. And of course, before the pandemic, one of the greatest sources of misinformation, or one of the greatest subjects of uh, misinformation and conspiracy theories was, was climate change. Uh, and this was partly, you know, weaponized uh, deceit, uh, the, you know, the, the um, uh, fossil fuel companies like willingly and quite intentionally and with, you know, targeted intentions, uh, trying to sow mistrust and confusion about climate change. Uh, one of the things to fight back on that that has worked is helping uh, the weather people, the, the weather reporters on local TV stations, um, giving them support to explain the you know what's happening in 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 their own communities, um, how like the temperature records are anomalous, the wildfires are anomalous. Um, here's you know here's looking back the past hundred years how the weather has changed in your you know in your community in your zip codes in your uh, you know regional uh, news area and um and that seems to have have been pretty effective in helping people understand that no climate change is real and it's happening right now and it's happening to us uh so i think there you know hopefully there are some lessons there and i think same way with the pandemic even though it was a global pandemic it was playing out in at different speeds at you know, different at different timings at different parts of the world so uh yeah localizing it seems to be seems to be one way to to help people comprehend what's happening and and perhaps it's most important since it's what's happening in their communities yeah and i i think you know we've we've really taken the pandemic you know in in how we just in how we cover it and it you know journalists have been responding to this in real time too what you know how do we make sense of the uncertainty and, and how do we help others just get more comfortable with un uncertainty? I think as science journalists um, and, and all types of science communicators, um, and, and really it's a much broader group, our, our world is just, it, it's changing so quickly. And, you know, with, especially with all the, uh, with, with the, with technology driving this even faster um, and with, you know, again, you know, we're talking about AI, you know, generally in this conference and, um, how do we, you know, really shape, um, you know, the next 10 years for the better? And I, I think it's worth really looking at, like, there's so many other elements that we need to be thinking about when we communicate and fear. I mean, climate change is is exploited for disinformation because people are afraid and or they don't want to change their ways. They're resistant. They don't want to have to confront the 
enormity of of what's going on and and so you know a lot of disinformation is really geared toward making people feel very certain and a black and white issue you know and and our role as as journalists is to really say it's not certain it's not black and white and we want to like help you know kind of hold hands and like wade through how complicated this is and make sense of it and start to say here is something we can do um here is something that will work and really look at those you know solutions based ideas while also just developing like more of a comfort as 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 journalists as as humans and as you know this ongoing conversation about the pandemic like how do we just get more comfortable with living in really uncertain times um and recognizing that a lot of power uh exploits um the uncertainty and how it, it makes us so susceptible to believing what we want to hear and, and it's really powerful to remember too as journalists or you know as as consumers of media of any kind that um you know we we talk a lot about like the the most offensive kinds of disinformation like the earth being flat or about you know nanobots that su surveil you being in the vaccine shot like things that are just so clearly sort of nuts and um and and you know just aren't true but a lot of the most effective misinformation um is rooted in seeds of truth um and that can often be something that's a little bit uncertain that science doesn't have fully figured out because very little in our world is fully figured out and so i think as communicators that's where we can go okay where are the things that people feel uncertain about and instead of trying to like convince them in the opposite direction of what they might have heard how can we acknowledge that something isn't fully figured out but we can use the best evidence we have today to make the best decisions that we can and that it's not about like science is right 100% of the time it's about there's a process for making decisions that's based in evidence and then updating that evidence and updating those decisions and i think that's what a lot of us are grappling with now as journalists and and obviously anyone like making policy around pandemic protocols um and i'm Laura i'm wondering because you've been working in this space for a very long time do you feel like there's been interesting updates in how people uh or agencies or institutions are tackling this do you think there's been some like good examples uh of of how communication has changed in like a top down way yeah i think so i mean i think uh from from a, like a science journalism perspective i think we're very aware of how our own practices can contribute to this kind of ping ponging um here's here's what science knows today and then it's different a week later so like most credible science journalists are not going to write a story about a, a small study saying that coffee is good or bad for you or red wine is good or bad for you because you know every study can you know can either fail to replicate or just not be representative and, and nutrition science is just really hard there are just a lot of obstacles to getting a clear answer from any nutrition thing um, so I think we're, we're trying to be more cautious about how um, how sure we are uh, when we're reporting the results of science and I think we're getting better at explaining the process and you know I think that the pandemic's been good you know, it's people are paying a lot of attention to science much more than they have you know certainly in my lifetime um and and so i think there's uh, among people who are interested to in how it really works i think there's a a kind of a greater appreciation that it's a global enterprise um that it's iterative that you can you know learn one thing uh about a variant and it can you know look really good or really bad and then that can change with more data um so i i hope people are you know are willing to come along with us as we do our best to to be more clear about how the process works and what we do and what we don't know. Um, because sometimes like if people have a question and there's no answer to it, just acknowledging, you know, scientists don't know this yet. There's not enough evidence yet. Maybe in six months we'll have enough evidence. Um, that kind of thing can at least, you know, start to fill the voids so that it doesn't get filled with misinformation. Um, but I, I want to say selfishly, uh, so we'll turn to questions from you all soon. Uh, so Jen and I, you know, we work at a magazine, Scientific American, and we um, we publish a lot of work by freelance writers. 
uh, freelance professional uh, journalists, professional writers, um, and a lot by by experts writing about their own area of expertise, either as a feature story or as an opinion piece. So if you have ideas for stories about this that you think would be interesting, either to write yourself or if there's you know somebody who who gave a really great talk here, you think we should invite to write for us, um, please feel free to get in touch. And I think we're both active on Twitter. Our emails are pretty easy to find, so please do feel free to get in touch after this. Um, and there's there's a bunch of good questions. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and questions. Um, I, I love that people people are excited about about this subject. Um, one of the questions I'm just going to ask it in case you have an example, Jen. I, I can't think of one myself, but uh, this is a, a question from Mickey McManus. Um, how do lessons learned from helping people escape from cults? Uh, is there anything that can teach us about how to build platforms or you know, combat misinformation and shift people towards science-based thinking? And I confess, I don't have a good answer for that, but that's one of these things where I thought, oh, that'd be a really good story. If anybody does have an answer to that, I'd love to read that. You know, I don't, I don't have like specific like research examples, but I, I have seen, um, and this sort of dovetails with what I said earlier, if, if you know, if you are really committed to to a belief system and um, and a cult, you know, which is an in group, and 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 part of part of what that how that works is that you're uh, saying the out groups cannot be trusted, and the only uh, the only right way of thinking is the way we think here, and so you're you're really sort of in this mindset of uh, demonizing others, and then if you might have doubts or or want to speak up something that's contrary to the group, you don't because you're afraid of being ostracized, and it's a very difficult thing to get out of because in in many ways it means severing your identity identity, and I think that's what's important to to realize. Um, it, it's not that extreme, of course. Uh, not every you know. Maybe not everyone who believes certain things is in a cult uh, of, of, of disinformation, but a lot of people are staking their identities on what they believe. And, um, and I think it's important to remember that they're not evil, bad people, but that they rely on this to, to define who they are. And so it is a process of reaching out and um, not disparaging someone for thinking that way, but of trying to, again, understand um, what they're afraid of and be inviting um, and to recognize that they're there because they needed an outlet um, for their identity. So how do you build identity and relationships and a feeling of belonging, a feeling of agency, a feeling of um, ha having your own sense of power? Like where I think the important thing is, is like, where do people get that from? And if they're missing that in their lives, and I, I think that's been, you know, whether you're escaping from a cult or um, or you're really deeply entrenched in in certain groups where other ways of thinking are not welcome. Um, I think that's what we're looking at. How do you reach people and understand what what got them into that situation to the first place? Um, and and that's about that. Those are trust issues and the the issue of misinformation and then correcting that with right information. That happens after that sort of found more foundational work has been done. And I, I think that's what we've learned broadly. Another thing I'll quickly mention since Laura mentioned flat earther, you know, the flat earther movement is that um, I'm blanking on the name, but there was a documentary a few years ago about conspiracy theories and, and the flat earther movement. And a, a scientist, an astrophysicist was, you know, saying it's actually really sad when you when you know it made made him feel sad that you see these people who are actually committed to like they want to do this research to 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 get to the bottom of the something of something and they're curious and they're engaging with others and collaborating on ideas how could we prove this theory and it's almost like people that if they weren't in like in in a slightly different world maybe they'd be a scientist because of that way of wanting to know and understand but what they're doing is they they have a they have they know what happens at the end and they're trying to you know, put together research that fits their idea rather than experimenting and being open to, oh, if that doesn't work out that way, maybe I'll, I'll change how I think or try something else. And I think I always come back to that idea of like, people are hungry for, for answers and for belonging. Um, and so how do we reach them that way first? Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough <laughs> one. 
um, so another question, just as Jen, in case you have a, a, a answer to this, uh, somebody asked, what is the most shocking or interesting misinformation related uh, news piece you've come across lately? Oh gosh. Um, I don't know if there's any single piece as much as, I mean, I, yeah, there's outrageous misinformation, misinformation, obviously. Um, and I think often there's, an, uh, we all, because we're humans and we like things that are outrageous, we focus on the, the, the most extreme examples. But what I've done as a journalist is I've become more interested in this and what I encourage everyone who's, who uh, consumes media of any kind to do is to look at the ways that misinformation is far more insidious in very small ways. Um, look at the way it comes up in you know, a dinner party with friends that you love and trust. Somebody might say something that has an echo of, of, of messaging that you know was propaganda. And, and to be aware of the way that this stuff is ju just seeps into all of our conversations and our, our choices. And you know, again, at, algorithmically, we are driven to, to, to see the things that are most egregious. Um, but I think it's actually more fascinating to start looking for the things that aren't quite as obvious, um, but are still signs of how misinformation affects how we perceive our world all over the place and in small ways. And when you start noticing those things, you become a much wiser consumer of, of the internet and it'll help you do better um, you know, in your own work. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And uh, so we're coming up on, well, we're past time. Um, I want to thank everybody for, for joining us and for and for caring about misinformation and for and for wanting to fight this great fight. Um, thank you for for everything you can do um, in your own social world, uh, you know, virtual and real to to sort of be a force for reality. Um, and as I say, get you know, get in touch with us if you have story ideas. Uh, you know, we we chat on Twitter all the time about this kind of stuff. We're both fascinated by it. Um, so we'll, I'll send it back to Deborah. Um, thank you, Jen. Thanks everybody for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been, it's been really fun talking with you. Ladies, you have energized me because this was an amazing session. Thank you so much for educating us on misinformation. It's really clear that technology has helped misinformation explode, but it's also a tool to help fight it. So professionally trained journalists like you guys, you don't, not only do you have to know the five W's, who, what, where, when, how, and how to report objectively on science, but you also need tech knowledge and skills. I mean, you're talking about AI, data analytics, statistics, understanding how algorithms work. So misinformation is really changing what's required of journalists and ultimately what's required of us if we wanna be informed citizens. Thank you, ladies. Everyone in the audience, thanks so much for joining us on this research stage today. I hope that you learned a lot and that you've gained some important insights. Don't forget to share your findings on social media using the hashtag COGX2021. Tomorrow is the last day of the festival, so do make sure to explore the many fantastic sessions across all of our stages. Have a great night. Thank you.